Big Braden interview, take one. I was trained as a scientist. My background's in the, in the hard sciences, the physical sciences, the earth sciences. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, when I received that training, there was no, uh, no room for the possibility of the kind of things that, that we're talking about now, the kinds of things that suggest that our inner world and our inner thoughts, feelings, emotions, beliefs in any way affect the world around us. Uh, and it was through direct experience uh, what I began to understand was that this is the great secret that everyone knows except us in the West. Uh, almost any other culture that we go to from uh, uh, the monasteries in Egypt and, uh, and Tibet and India and to Bolivia and Peru, the indigenous traditions, little villages in the Andes Mountains, they all know that there is this experience that we can have inside of our bodies that affects our world in some way and our science simply uh, has not allowed for that historically. Well, I was trained as a scientist and I was trained to look in the world around me for my answers so I began to go to these places. I began to go into the monasteries, uh, uh, all the places that I mentioned. And it was through the direct experience of, uh, of sitting in the presence of people who have lived and practiced uh, the, the kinds of traditions that Louise Hay and the, the, the other authors I'm, I'm so blessed to be sharing this, uh, the stage and this information with, that they, they teach about. And what we begin to understand is that this is the place where science got it wrong. There are two places, two assumptions that science has made, modern science, uh, and they're, they're coming full circle and correcting that now, but the first one is that the space that we believe is empty is not really so empty. It's, it's full of a, of a living essence, of a living material that we're only beginning to understand, number one. And number two, the fact, and it is a fact now, that we may have experiences inside of our bodies that influence the world beyond our bodies through the conduit of what's in this space. So it was in going into the monasteries and the nunneries and speaking with the indigenous people, looking at them eye to eye, heart to heart, God to God, and I could say to these people, when you just perform that miracle, when you just perform that miraculous healing, what is it that you did inside of your body to make that happen? And if I didn't understand what they told me, I'd ask them again and again and again through the translators until I understood that they were creating an experience producing an effect inside of their bodies that my science never told me was possible or, or existed. And that was the path that led me. I, and I, I just want to emphasize, science is good. And uh, I believe our science is good and served us well. It simply is incomplete. And so it was that path uh, that allowed me to flesh out the missing pieces that uh, we're only beginning to understand today, marrying the best science of our time with the wisdom, 5,000 years of wisdom of, of our past. Uh, into a greater understanding and that understanding brings us right back to the question that's a long answer to a short question but it's it's it brings us back to where, where we're only now beginning to understand that there is something that we can do in our lives that influence not only the the physical body uh ours and, and those of other people around us but but literally influence the physical reality of our world and that changes everything it changes everything that we in the West believe about ourselves. So as a scientist, I've also come to understand this is a very different way for many people to think about themselves and their world. And, uh, and I've found that there is a, there's a learning curve that our audiences and our friends and families and coworkers in my career at the Water Fountain, this is not something that people typically talk about in a, a technical organization. They don't wake up in the morning and say, what kinds of feelings what kinds of dreams, what kinds of healings did you have over the weekend? And they're talking about uh, who won the football game and who won the lotteries. But this is, this is where it brings us, uh, the relevance in our lives, because we all are having experiences every day, whether we are consciously aware of it or not, those experiences are physically affecting our bodies and our world. What Western science now is beginning to understand only in the last years of the 20th and now the first years of the 21st century. It is now a scientific fact that the, the space between things is anything but empty. It is full of a, a living, pulsating essence that is so new scientists have yet to agree on a single term. Some are calling it a quantum hologram, very technical sounding name. Um, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, the former Apollo astronaut, I've had the honor of sharing a stage with him a number of times. He calls it nature's mind. Stephen Hawking calls it the mind of God. Others simply call it the field. In 1944, the father of quantum physics, Max Planck, 
identified the existence of this field and he called it the matrix. He said underlying everything that we see, our bodies included, everything we see in the world around us in our bodies, he said there is the existence of, of what must be a conscious and intelligent mind. This is his language in 1944. He said that this mind is the matrix of all matter and it's from his work that the movie series uh, began and, and uh, many of the ideas that we have today. So what we know is this, is that we have the opportunity to influence that field in ways now that we're only beginning to understand. It's done through the human heart. It's not a thinking process. Thoughts are important. But the ancients made the distinction between thoughts and feelings and emotions. And it's the feelings that are, are centered in our heart, what are called coherent, heart-based emotions. We know that when we feel a feeling of love, compassion, understanding, forgiveness, we change the self-esteem. Uh, that there's an effect from that, that it changes the electrical and the magnetic fields in our heart and that those fields literally change the stuff that our world is made of uh, around our bodies. Our hearts are the strongest magnetic field in, in our bodies and our, our hearts are the strongest electrical field in our bodies, much more so than the brain. While the brain does create those kinds of fields, the heart is many times stronger. And what the science now is showing is that when you can change the field that the atom is in, you change the atom. And we're made of those atoms. So when we have feelings in our hearts, we're changing the field uh, that connects the stuff everything is made of. And we literally are altering our physical reality in ways that sound miraculous uh, in Western science. But again, this is the great secret everyone knows except us because Western science has only arrived at this understanding you go to these ancient and indigenous traditions and cultures, it's where they begin. They begin with the understanding, sure, everything's connected, and sure, we're part of it. And then they take us one step further, and they say, here, I'll show you. I'll show you how to create the, the effects in your body so that you, can, that you can heal your body, and you can heal the bodies of others. You can change your self-esteem, and your body will mirror that change. Uh, it doesn't have to be a long, slow, drawn-out process. It can happen uh, very, very quickly. It can happen in a matter of minutes. We have, uh, we have video documentation uh, from medicineless hospitals in Beijing, China, for example, where they understand these practices and they've employed them uh, for, for several thousand years. And we can look into the body of a living woman with a cancerous tumor that Western science says is inoperable. And then we can watch as three practitioners that understand the language of human emotion. They create the feeling in their bodies they're not looking at that tumor as an illness. They see that woman as whole, healthy, vital, completely enabled, fully capacitated. And as they feel that feeling strongly among themselves, her physical body mirrors that. And we can see it through sonograms. We can see that tumor disappear in less than three minutes. And that's how quickly reality can change. And this is where the disconnect comes in with Western science. Because I've shared this information with scientists and medical doctors all over the world, and they say, wow, that's a miracle. We're going to have to come back and study this, and we will as soon as we find a cure for cancer, <laughs> or as soon as we, we find the, 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 the cure to cure on a mechanical level, what they see as a mechanical process. And what we now know is, is our physical body is the outpicturing, uh, is, is the mirror of something that is not so physical. And this is, this is where science now is, is only arriving. The three practitioners in the medicineless hospital in Beijing did not judge that cancerous tumor. They didn't judge it right, wrong, good, or bad. They said it's a quantum possibility, and there are many possibilities. Of course, this is just one. They said, now we're going to choose another one. But this is a subtle and very, very different way of looking at things because they acknowledge what is and invite a new possibility rather than having a charge on, on what is there and feeling that somehow we have to manipulate or cut out in the case of a tumor uh, or change, the, hammer the physical reality into submission, what they're doing is acknowledging that, that moment, that example, and they're changing it on the, the level of what we would call the quantum blueprint. They're feeling the feeling as if another possibility has, has occurred, and in doing so, allowing that possibility to replace the one that exists without judging the one that exists.
I worked, uh, I was an aerospace engineer in um, Denver, Colorado during the, the last years of the Cold War, the 1980s, and it was when the, the famous brown cloud was inundating Denver, and we couldn't all drive on the same days. We had to carpool on different days, and, and one day I went to an engineer friend's house to, to do my carpool for that week, and I got there a little early, and I'd never been to his house before, and I said, can I use your bathroom? And I went in there, and he had little post-it notes of affirmations all over the bathroom, and it said, my perfect mate is manifesting for me now. My perfect mate is manifesting for me now. We got in his car and he had little post-it notes all over the dashboard in the rearview mirror. My perfect mate is manifesting for me now. And of course I knew what his office looked like and it was the same way. He had them all over the walls and the CRT. I said, does this affirmation work for you? He said, nah. He said, he said it never does. And I said, why do you think that is? And he said, well, well look at me. Who'd want to be with somebody like me? I'm, I'm just an engineer. You know, he had a very low self-esteem about himself. And I began to think about the way that he was applying those affirmations and other people have applied them very successfully and what I found the difference was for him it was it was a thought process that never went beyond what was happening in his mind in his own picturing his own self-esteem and the thought is important the ancients are very clear about this in the Sanskrit text they, they tell us that the thought the image of the quantum possibility so in other words in in the realm of all possibilities, everything already exists. My friend's perfect relationship and the worst one he'll ever have. Uh, the lightest of the light, the darkest of the dark. Our, our greatest healing and our greatest suffering, they're already there. And what they invite us to do in these ancient traditions is to reach into those possibilities with our mind. This is the power of the mind. And isolate, we lock in one of those possibilities. So now we have taken it and identified it. However, to bring it into this world, to breathe life into that possibility is the power of human emotion. Our love for that possibility or our fear of that possibility, either one will work. To bring that quantum possibility into the particle reality of our everyday lives. We don't have to know that, it sounds very technical, we just have a feeling. But this is the science of, uh, appears to be the science of, of how these things are working. So this is why our self-esteem is so important. When we feel, when my engineer friend felt that why would anybody want to be with me is, is what he said to me. The affirmation for him was an empty affirmation. It was a thought that had no energy uh, to, to invite it into this world. Uh, and, and an example of, of just the opposite of that is I know of other people who have simply made a list of all of the attributes uh, of, of a perfect partner in life because this is what many people I'm using as an example it works in healing it works in peace but we're talking about relationships they make a, a, a list of all those attributes and then then they come from the place that that relationship is already happening what what is their life like how is their life different now that that perfect partner is there how is their evening different how do they spend their time differently how they feel when they wake up in the morning and share their lives with someone and it's those feelings that they live throughout the day. It's not something you sit down and do for a minute and then you get up and walk away. Rather, it's something that we become. We live our lives as if these experiences have already happened. And in that way, we invite them into our lives and they happen frighteningly quickly for some people. Uh, it's amazing. I know people that haven't finished their list and they go out for lunch or a cup of coffee while they're making the list and the person that just brought them their lunch is the person that's on that list and they fall in love and they're married and they're married 20 years later. Uh, I know people that's happened to. So it's about clarity. It's about specificity. Uh, it's about being personal, uh, being very clear that these are personal desires. Scientifically, it appears that this field, the divine matrix, uh, it, it is a mirror uh, and a bridge between our inner and our outer worlds. And it can only give us what we give it to work with. And the interesting thing is that we have been conditioned to feel the feelings of the things that we don't want in life and that we're afraid of. We wake up in the morning and we see the six o'clock news and all the things to be afraid of and then we go through our day saying, oh, I hope I'm not going to see that today or I hope it's not around the corner. And, and my question, uh, so fascinating me, where do we learn to feel the things that we don't want rather than things that we choose to have? And how would our lives be different if we, if we could cut through all, all, of the, um, all of the static and simply choose in our lives what we would like each moment of each day or our relationships or our abundance or our careers or the peace in our families to look like? What would our, 
What would our lives look like if we could do that? Uh, and there's very good, very good scientific evidence showing precisely what our lives would look like because, because we would very quickly experience everything that we've created. As a scientist, one of the first things I had to understand, and again, my training, I was trained in the hard sciences and there was no allowance for any inner experience uh, to have, have an effect on our outer world to begin with. Number two, I was raised in a relatively conservative community in the Midwest. I was born in Missouri, Kansas City, Missouri. <clears throat> Excuse me, in that part of the world, when you talk about emotions, they kind of get lumped into this nebulous experience of, you know, thoughts, feelings, emotions are all the same thing. We really don't talk about them much. And by the way, as a male, we don't want to see much of yours. So that was, that was my upbringing. So I began to understand when we go into the other cultures, and I'm referring again and again to this wisdom. We had this wisdom in Western cultures and it was lost in the fourth century. About 1700 years ago, it was edited right out of our most cherished uh, spiritual and religious traditions, the biblical edits of the fourth century. It was not edited from the other cultures uh, that, that we have visited, and that's the value of going into these cultures. And they identify three separate yet related experiences that we all have in our bodies, and they literally call them thought, feeling, and emotion. And here's the difference. The thinking they identify with the three upper energy centers of the body. The Sanskrit traditions have a seven energy center or seven chakra system that they work with. And they say the upper three are related to what we call thought or logic processes. So when we think about something, we picture it in our mind, that perfect relationship or peace between nations. But we can only invite it into our lives when we breathe the power of emotion into that thought. The emotion comes from the lower three of those creative centers in our bodies. So when we breathe the power of emotion into our thought, we imbue that thought with life. And those two energies meet in the one center that is not accounted for yet in our model. It's in our heart or what scientists call the seven layer liquid crystal oscillator in the center of our chest, but we'll just call it our heart because that's what it does. Our heart is creating electrical and magnetic waves that are influencing the world around us based on what we think and the emotion that we breathe into those thoughts to create the feeling. So now we've just defined feeling. Feeling by definition from the Sanskrit tradition is the union of thought and emotion it creates the feeling. Now what makes this really interesting is that those traditions say we are capable of only two primary emotions, love and whatever we feel the opposite of love is. And when you get really deep into the teachings, there are two aspects of the same thing. But what they say is when we have our thought, we are either breathing the love of that thought or our fear of that thought to create the feeling. And the feeling then becomes sadness or joy or compassion or anger. Those are not emotions, those are feelings. Now for some people they say, well, you know, it's, it's an, it, you're nitpicking. What difference could it make? And these are the subtle differences between these, these ancient ways of viewing this inner technology. It's literally a technology because we can have the same thought or the same affirmation and imbue it with a different emotion and have completely different feelings and create a different, uh, a different outcome. And this is the great secret that was edited out of our Christian and pre-Christian, Judeo-Christian traditions uh, when 45 books were removed in the fourth century. 20 were taken out completely. Another 25 were condensed and, and rearranged. Uh, and we know this because we found the information now in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Nag Hammadi Library, the Coptic, the Gnostic texts. So we know what those texts would have said if, if we had had them. But the interesting thing is, without those texts, we, we tend to rely upon the written word, the validation, to feel that power in our bodies. I think everyone senses or suspects that there is an untapped potential in the human body. I've been on every continent of the earth, and I've asked every, every audience I've ever been in, do you feel that that's there? And they say, yes. We feel there's something there, but, but we just can't quite get it. Why is that? So we have a, a feeling that there's more to us, but we rely on a written validation in a 5,000-year-old text or a scientific study to tell us that it's true. And this is, uh, I think, the, the value of going into those texts is, is we get to see the words that literally say uh, in the Gospel of Thomas, the lost Gospel of Thomas, it literally says, when these two become one, when thought 
and emotion become one, then you'll say to the mountain, move, and the mountain will move. And I used to think that that was a metaphor. And I now have seen enough to know that moving a cancerous tumor inside the body of a living woman, that's moving a mountain to me. And, and it's all done from marrying thought and emotion together. 1998, I had my, my first journey into the highlands of, of central China and Tibet. And it was during that time we were given a personal audience with an abbot uh, who's an elderly uh, leader of, of a particular sect in the monastery. Uh, and this abbot passed just a couple of years ago, so I'm glad that we spoke with him when, when we did. And it was this man, I asked the question that I asked every monk, every nun, I asked the shaman in, in Peru and Bolivia, but I had the clearest response from this man. And I asked him a question, I said, when we see your prayers on the outside, and we see you in the, in the chanting hall for 12, 16, 18 hours a day, and we see the bells and the bowls and the mutras and the mantras and the gongs and the chimes and the incense, when we see your prayers on the outside, I said, what are you doing on the inside? And this was the man that looked at me, he said, you've never seen our prayers, because a prayer cannot be seen. He said, what you see are the things we do to create the feeling in our body, and the feeling is the prayer. And then he turned the question on me, and he said, how do you do this in your culture? Through a translator. And I began to think about this and realize that when we lost the words in our most cherished spiritual traditions that tell us that feeling is a language that speaks to our bodies in this world, when we lost the words that validated that, we began to think that the words themselves were the prayers, and if we say, or the affirmations, and if we say those words the right number of times, the right time of day or the right time of year, that we've said our prayer or our affirmation, and then if it doesn't work, we get frustrated, and we say, well, my prayer didn't work, or my affirmation's not working for me, because we lost the link with feeling and emotion. When I was in the monasteries in Tibet, and the abbot had passed, a new abbot took his place, who was already in his mid-80s. He's the new young abbot, he's already in his mid-80s. And I asked him a question, this was in 2005, we just went back. And I asked him a question, and I said, I said, what is the force in your tradition, in your belief system, what is the force that connects the universe? What's the force that holds everything together? And through the translator, he answered me with one word. And I thought I heard it incorrectly. And I said, would you do that again? And he came back and he answered me with one word and he said, compassion. And I said, well, wait a minute. I said, is compassion a force that holds everything together, or is it a feeling that we experience in our bodies? And he said, yes. And that was very powerful for me to understand that. Because it says that we have the ability to feel in our bodies the stuff that holds this universe together. And we're really not so different from those quantum particles in the stars beyond us, or in the tumor that's in front of us, in the suffering of, of our loved ones, or in the peace between the nations. It's all part of the same thing. The challenge is to make it more than an intellectual exercise. How do we know we're part of all that is? One of the ways that helped me come to that realization, there was an experiment that was done in 1997 uh, in Geneva, Switzerland, made world headlines. 3,500 reporters from the science journals were there. They, they documented this experiment, and it didn't, didn't make the cover of Time magazine or USA Today, although I think it should have. And what the experiment showed, the bottom line, was that when you take the stuff our world is made of, a particle of matter, one particle, and even if you split that particle and send each portion to different locations, which is what this experiment did, they had they split one particle of matter and sent one particle seven miles this direction, the other seven miles that direction, they were 14 miles apart, and even though they were separated physically, they were still connected energetically so that when one particle had an experience, they would disturb one particle, the other one acted like it was having the experience. Sometimes the other one would act like it was having the experience before the scientist even disturbed the first particle. And it's mind-boggling. They said, well, well, how can this be? But what this tells us is that once matter is physically joined, even when it becomes separate, the energy is still there that's connecting it. And this is why it's important to me, because if we go back far enough in time all the particles of matter of this entire universe that are expanding were all meshed together in a single particle about the size of a green pea, is what scientists tell us today, is what the computer models suggest. 
that if you could go into the universe today and take all the particles of matter and take out all the space in between and bring it together and compress it into a size of a single green pea, it means that you and me and every one of our listeners, we were all once part of that same particle that creates this whole universe today. And even though those particles are now separate and expanding, and, and the studies show that they are, energetically we're all still linked. When we lost the information telling us we're a part of all that we see, we found ourselves on a very technological path without the wisdom of us being in the equation. So we thought it's the world out there and that we're separate from that world. Now what's happened is our technology has come so far that our very existence is threatened by the technology that we've developed, whether it's the wars or the viruses or the climate change. So so I believe we've come full circle now to survive our time in history. We've got to write ourselves back into the equation. Our prayers, our affirmations, our beliefs, uh, our language. And when they're spoken through the language of the heart, they have a, a direct, uh, powerful, and immediate impact on our bodies and the world around us. And it invites us to be very, very aware of what it is that we truly hold in our hearts as is the truth of our world, because we live that in our lives, from the lightest of the light to the darkest of the dark, the greatest fears and the greatest joys. What we're beginning to understand is that human emotion and feeling and belief is literally a language. It's a nonverbal language that this field recognizes and understands and the field works in what we call real time. It doesn't know about a few minutes from now. So if you say, if you say in your affirmation, 20 minutes from now, uh, I'd, I'd like for my perfect mate to manifest for me now, it doesn't know about 20 minutes from now. It, it is a real time application. And this is why the, the key, and this is what the ancients say, and this is what the monks and the nuns tell us real time today. They say to be very specific about what it is that we're choosing to have in our lives, because what we're doing, and it helps if we understand this, what we're doing is in the world of quantum possibility, in the soup, the nebulous soup of all possibilities, what we're doing is we're isolating, we're locking one into place. And if we're not specific about what that possibility is, then how can the field be specific about what it is that, that it gives to us? Whatever it takes to get us to the point where we can transcend the limits, the laws of physics and biology as we've known them in the past. We have a power within us that transcends those laws that we're more than our mistakes, that we're more than the suffering, we're more than the limits that we believed in the past. And uh, that is where I say, wow, that really inspires me.